Next, it's my greatest privilege to introduce our moderator for our second panel, an incredible role model who supported and lent her gracious guidance since day one of our planning of the symposium, Professor Miyako Pettitoledo. Professor Pettitoledo received her bachelor's from Harvard and JD here at the William S. Richardson School of Law, graduating as valedictorian in 2015 before returning to Richardson as a law professor teaching civil procedure and legal writing. She has gone on to accomplish so many great things, including serving as an executive director and managing attorney at Maximum Legal Services Corporation and litigation association attorney at M4. She's also the part perfect moderator for this panel on women in the state and federal judiciary because of her clerkship experience for a Hawaii Supreme Court justice and for United States District Court Judge Susan Oki Maui, who's here with us today, as a scholar advocating for civil and human rights and social justice, Professor Pedro Toledo currently serves on the advisory committee of the Hawaii State Bar Association's Leadership Institute and the Hawaii Supreme Court Committee on Equality and Access to the Courts. Welcome, Professor Pedro Toledo. Mahalo, Suyan. And aloha kako, Belina mai. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I wanted to send a special thank you to Suyan and Sarah Ann and the UH Law Review editors and staff writers for putting together such a wonderful symposium to honor women in the law. Um, I'm feeling right now so inspired having heard from the last panel speaking to the experiences of women and gender minorities in legal practice including some of their insightful observations of women judges and specifically Asian women judges in the profession. So this panel in, in many ways is going to continue that conversation, considering women in the state and federal judiciary and offering perspectives from the bench. Although women historically were excluded from positions on the bench in more recent history, they have been appointed to important positions in the court systems and they have made impactful changes ever since. As the late Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg once reflected, I do think that being the second female Supreme Court justice is wonderful because it is a sign that being a woman in a place of importance is no longer extraordinary. She went on to say that people certainly know that women are present on the court and we are all over the bench and we are certainly here to stay. Distinguished jurists in our Hawaii courts, both federal and state, have led the way in breaking these barriers to the bench for women and particularly women of color. Judge Susan Oki Maui, one of the distinguished jurists joining the panel today and my former boss, was a trailblazer as the first Asian American woman appointed to the federal bench. She has earned many awards and recognitions for her outstanding achievements, including the Trailblazer Award from the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association and the Hawaii Women Lawyers Outstanding Women Lawyer of the Year Award and Outstanding Judicial Achievement Award. She has paved the way for other Asian women to do the same, including Judge Leslie Kobayashi, who you will hear from later today on the Title IX panel, and Judge Jill Otaki of the U.S. District Court for the District of Hawaii. These three jurists are part of the group known as the First 15. The title of Judge Maui's path-breaking research and book published in 2021 on how Asian women became federal judges, which you will hear more about from her later today. Justice Paula Nakayama, who is retiring this year after serving 30 years on the Hawaii Supreme Court, set her own trailblazing and record-setting judicial career in the state system. You can read more about her far-reaching impacts in Isaac Moriwaki's essay that will be published as part of the special UH Law Review Symposium issue. For her incredible work, achievements, and jurisprudence, she has rightfully earned the title, The Lady of Justice of Hawaii, the title of his essay. Likewise, there are many other women serving on the bench, including Associate Justice Sabrina McKenna of the Hawaii Supreme Court, who you will also hear later today on the Title IX panel, and two of our distinguished jurist panelists, Chief Judge Lisa Kudgenoza of the Intermediate Court of Appeals and Circuit Court Judge Jeanette Castanetti of Oahu's First Circuit. And there are many more who have led the way and continue to lead the way, doing the hard work and opening the doors to the courthouse 
just a bit wider for other women to join them in the future, including some of our attendees that I noticed from the earlier panel and wanted to give a shout out to, Associate Judge Sonia McCullen, Judge Clarissa Malinau, Judge Kirsten Haman, Judge Natasha Shaw, and retired Judge Virginia Crandall. Thanks to all of you for being here today and supporting this event. For our panel today, Judge Malway will first begin with some remarks on women and diversity in the federal judiciary, followed by Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald, who will share some perspectives on women and diversity in the state judiciary. We will then have a short conversation with Judge Ganoza and Judge Castanetti, and we'll end with some brief takeaways from all the panelists. So without further ado, I am honored to introduce our distinguished jurists that have joined us today. They are each incredible and deserve so much more than these short introductions that I'm able to give them today. The Honorable Susan Okimawe was born and raised in Hawaii. She received her BA and MA in English Literature from the University of Hawaii and then taught English there. She went on to graduate cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review. Nominated by President Clinton, Judge Malway became a United States District Judge for the District of Hawaii in 1998. She served as the District Chief Judge from 2009 to 2015. Before becoming a judge, she was a civil litigation partner at Cage Shetty and served as an adjunct professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Thanks for being with us here today, Judge Malway. The Honorable Mark Rechtenwald has served as the Chief Justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court since September 2010. Prior to that, he was an Associate Justice on the Hawaii Supreme Court and served as the Chief Judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals beginning in April 2007. Before joining the bench, Chief Justice Rechtenwald served as the Director of the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs as an Assistant United States Attorney for the District of Hawaii and as an attorney in private practice. Chief Justice Rechtenwald received his undergraduate degree from Harvard University and his JD from the University of Chicago. Thank you as well, Chief Justice, for being here with us today. The Honorable Lisa Ganoza has served as Chief Judge of the Intermediate Court of Appeals since April 2018. Prior to that, she served as an Associate Judge beginning in May 2010. A proud graduate of the William S. Richardson School of Law, Chief Judge Ganoza served as a law clerk to the Honorable Daniel P. King, Senior Judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Hawaii. She later became a civil litigation partner in private practice at McCorsey Miller Mukai McKinnon. In 2005, she was appointed as the first Deputy Attorney General for the State of Hawaii. She currently serves as Chair for the Commission to Promote and Advance Civil Education and as a board member for the American Judicature Society. It's nice to see you again. Chief Judge Ganoza, thank you. And last but not least, the Honorable Jeanette Castanetti has been presiding over the civil calendar of the First Circuit Court for the State of Hawaii since her appointment in 2010. Prior to that, she served as a per diem district judge beginning in 2007. Since joining the, the court, judge, Canas judge Castanetti has occupied numerous incredible leadership positions. In 2015, she became a senior judge of the Environmental Court, and in 2017, she was designated Deputy Chief Judge and Administrative Judge of the First Circuit Civil Division for her tremendous role and achievements in the newly promulgated amendments to the Hawaii Rules of Civil Procedure. She was recently recognized and celebrated as the 2022 Jurist of the Year. Before her tenure on the bench, a graduate of California Western School of Law, Judge Castanetti served as a civil litigation attorney at Bronster Hoshibata and as a deputy prosecuting attorney. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. And now let's welcome and turn our attention to Judge Mawe for her remarks on women in the federal judiciary. Oh, Judge, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Well, I thank you for including me in this symposium, symposium and on this panel with illustrious judges from the state court system. I know all of them, and I admire all of them. And what I'm expecting today is to learn 
a lot from all of them. For myself, I will be focusing on women in the federal courts with particular emphasis on the federal courts here in Hawaii. When I passed the bar in 1981, there was no woman serving at any level of the federal courts in Hawaii. It was not until uh, Helen Gilmore became a federal district judge here in Hawaii in 1994 that Hawaii's federal courts had their first woman. I remember that um, she looked out at the women in the audience at her investiture and said, I am leaving the door wide open. At that time, I had no idea that four years later, I would walk through that door. Hawaii is allotted four active district judge spots, and today two of them are filled by women. Leslie Kobayashi appointed in 2010 and Jill Otake appointed in 2018. Leslie Kobayashi's district judgeship was preceded by her service as a federal magistrate judge. A magistrate judge is selected by the district judges in the district and serves renewable eight-year terms. Judge Kobayashi was the first woman magistrate judge in Hawaii. She remains to date the only woman to have become a federal magistrate judge in Hawaii and the only federal magistrate judge in Hawaii, regardless of gender, to become a federal district judge. There has not yet been a woman living in Hawaii who has become a federal court of appeals judge or a bankruptcy judge. Women first joined the federal judiciary by being appointed to non-lifetime judgeships. And that occurred in the early uh, uh, 20th century. The first Article III woman judge was Florence Ellenwood Allen, who was appointed in 1934 to the Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Article III judges are appointed for a term of good behavior rather than for a term of a set number of years and include circuit and district judges and Supreme Court justices. We are not yet at the century mark for women in Article III ranks. Today, about a third of active federal judges, including active Article III judges and active non-Article III judges are women, even though women are about half the population. When I started law school in 1978, my class was about a quarter women. And when I began practicing law here in Honolulu, women litigators, particularly women litigators handling commercial disputes, were a relatively small group. I recall an incident some decades ago when I was practicing law that involved one of my co-panelists who came through that incident looking like a fabulous role model even then. Chief Justice Rechtenwall and I were on opposite sides of a case, and he represented someone I was deposing. The deponent was a man some years older than I was, who repeatedly called me honey and sweetie. At the time, I could have named a number of male attorneys who would have chided me for each time asking the deponent to stop doing that. And those attorneys would likely have told me I was making a really big deal out of something not important. To his credit, Chief Justice Rechtenwall was not one of those attorneys, and he firmly admonished his client and told him to call me either Ms. Malway or counsel, something I have always appreciated. When President Obama was in office, he set what was then a record when 42% of his judicial appointees were women. 
as laudable as that percentage was, had it been maintained, it would have ensured that women never achieved parity in the federal judiciary. A new record has been set by President Biden. About three quarters of his judicial appointees are women. This increase may have been at least partly in response to vigorous advocacy by individuals and organizations seeking not just greater representation by women, but also by race and ethnicity, by sexual orientation, by law school, and by career background. I have some optimism that the number of women Article III judges will continue to increase as the past increases in women law students yield more and more experienced women lawyers in the pool of applicants. Of course, just having more women lawyers does not guarantee more women federal judges. A host of circumstances can affect who becomes a federal judge, not the least of which is pure luck. An Article III judge is nominated by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate, so the appointment process is overtly political, and one must be in the right place at the right time. Many promising candidates never become federal judges because vacancies occurred when they were, for example, too young or too old to be considered prime appointment candidates. This kind of circumstance beyond the applicant's control applies to all applicants, but women may be affected more because the roles that women often play with their families may make it harder for them to take advantage of opportunities arising at difficult times. A less overtly political selection process applies to non-Article III judgeships. As I noted earlier, magistrate judges are appointed by district judges. Bankruptcy judges are appointed by court of appeals judges. The appointing judges must select from short lists prepared by selection committees made up of lawyers and non-lawyers. You might think that women and people of color would fare better in this kind of selection process than in the overtly political process set up for Article III judges. Nationwide data indicate that that is not the case. Magistrate judges and bankruptcy judges are even less diverse as a national group than Article III judges. The selection committee members are appointed by the selecting judges, meaning that Article III judges have considerable opportunities to further diversify the ranks of magistrate judges and bankruptcy judges. And yet, in federal courts across the country, those ranks continue to need more diversification. Having said that, I recognize that one thing Article III judges have only limited ability to influence is the nature of the applicant pool. Now, the need for further diversification of federal judges cannot be blamed entirely on the applicant pool. But the more women apply, the harder it will be for the federal judiciary to underrepresent women. Certainly, judges may encourage candidates to apply for judgeships, but in the end, the ultimate decision to apply rests with individual candidates. So Miyoko was nice enough to mention my study of the first 15 Asian uh, women Article III judges. And one of the things I saw in studying those judges was that it was not unusual for women to fail to see themselves in positions of power. Women who are excellent lawyers usually recognize their own competence and skill, but they may simply not envision themselves in black robes. This 
failure of imagination was common, even among women who are judges today, but who needed the encouragement of others to begin to think of themselves as judges. For many of the 15 women I studied, it happened that their first serious thought about seeking an Article III judgeship came after friends or mentors urged them to apply. That is, they did not have the thought on their own. In fact, many of them were taken greatly aback by the suggestion. I did not see women thinking that they could not do the job well. Rather, what I saw was women not thinking about the job at all. As the number of women judges in the federal judiciary increases, I certainly hope that seeking a judgeship may come to seem more and more normal for more and more women. Those of us who are judges can do our part in this regard. In settings like this very symposium, we can preach the need to be ready to take advantage of all opportunities. Sometimes attorneys can plan for those opportunities. I have a really good example. In our own federal district, two district court vacancies are expected to arise in 2024. When Michael Seabright and Leslie Kobayashi step away from being active district judges and take senior status, which is my current status. Many people describe it as a kind of semi-retirement. But there are other times when a vacancy arises unexpectedly. The vacancy I was appointed to fill arose when, to the surprise of most of the legal community, Judge Harold Fong died at the young age of 57. I ended up putting my name in only after more than one lawyer asked me whether I was planning to apply. This was a surprise to me to be asked these things, but it made me think about applying. Women may hesitate to apply, not just because a judgeship has not been in their thoughts, but also because they suspect that they will not be selected ultimately. And my response to such a concern is, you cannot win any game if you do not play. It is the rare candidate who chooses not to play, but who nevertheless gets plucked out of obscurity by some important person like a senator. For the most part, to become a judge, you need to put yourself forward. You need to choose to expose yourself to scrutiny. The road to being nominated for an Article III judgeship can be very long. And sometimes, even after you're nominated, the road to being confirmed can be even longer. I was nominated by President Bill Clinton in December 1995. It was not until June 1998 that the Senate confirmed me. So I was a nominee in limbo for about two and a half years. Staying the course was something done by many of the 15 Article III women judges that I studied. One of them faced a serious illness and was in chemotherapy along the way. Another lost her mother to a ruptured aneurysm. Some had to overcome political opposition and many did not get confirmed right away. Needing to persevere is not unique to federal judicial applicants. And of course, among federal judicial applicants, it is not unique to women applicants. But if you do apply, you probably need to brace yourself to be in it for the long haul. Although I studied the first 15 Asian women to become Article III judges, and I didn't put out my book that long ago, by now there are 27 Asian women who are Article III judges. So it is nearly time for 
someone, someone else, not me, to chronicle the stories of the second 15, or possibly to chronicle the stories of all women judges, state and federal, in Hawaii. I hope that those of you in today's audience will take to heart the need to put yourselves forward so that our federal judiciary can better reflect our community. Only then can the federal courts here in Hawaii have the respect and credibility essential to making them most effective. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judge Molly, for that update on the federal judiciary and for inspiring future generations of female federal judges. I hope some in the audience are going to strive to become the first uh, female bankruptcy judge in our in our circuit or the first uh, Hawaii female circuit court judge in our appellate system, as well as just continuing to break the barriers as you have now paved the way to do for them. So thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to ask Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald to sort of provide the counterpart to what Judge Molly was talking about and to provide an update on our women and diversity efforts in the state judiciary. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Petit Toledo, for moderating today. And thank you to the Law Review and Suyan Burns and Sarah Ann Mao for all their hard work in making this amazing event possible. I also want to acknowledge uh, Michaela Eidiger and Lisa Lum, who uh, joined me in writing the article that I'm submitting as part of today. And then, of course, uh, acknowledging uh, Judges Malwe, Ganoza, and Castagnetti for their amazing careers and for being here today and for the influence that each of them has had on me, uh, both personally and professionally. I'm deeply grateful and, and honored to be here and be uh, a part of this event along with them. Uh, I did want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Justice uh, Paula Nakayama, who is, as, as um, Professor Petit Toledo mentioned, about to leave the court. Uh, she has had uh, an amazing impact on, on the judiciary as a whole, but in the court in, in particular, with more than 200 published opinions during her 30 years here, uh, and is going to leave uh, a, a, an impact that I think will last uh, for the, as long as this court is here, I think her impact will be felt in our jurisprudence. Um, I think it's interesting to note uh, when she was appointed back in 1993, she was the second woman uh, appointed to this court and the first woman of color. The first woman, Justice Rhoda Lewis, served from 1959 to 1967. And if you go back and look at the history of the court and the judiciary, there have been on occasion women judges, uh, the original Supreme Court, uh, established by the Kingdom of Hawaii in 1840, had a woman, Keikalu Ohi, who sat on the court as uh, uh, Kuhina Nui. There were others at various points during the uh, course of, of, of our court's history, but as recently as 53 years ago, our judiciary was entirely men, um, and that's when Judge Betty Vitusek was appointed in the family court of the First Circuit um, and uh, in 1970. So, and now, uh, as I'll mention in more detail in a moment, 49% uh, of our, our state full-time judges are women. So we've come an, a, an awful long way. We have a lot of work left to do uh, in the work I don't think will ever be over, but uh, we've come a long way. And I want to share a little bit about uh, how I think we've been able to come so far in that in those five decades. Um, first of all, I just want to set the stage uh, just how dramatically women are underrepresented in le leadership roles in the legal profession. Um, women are 55% of law students, 40% of attorneys at law firms, but only 25% of the equity partners nationwide are women, and 34% of state judges nationwide. And as Judge Malway said, the stat I saw was about 37%, but just a little over a third in the federal judiciary are women. So there's a big disparity between the number of women who are going to law school and entering the profession and those who are uh, taking on leadership roles, whether on the bench or in law firms. And I think we need to understand why that is and, um, and, and take active and proactive steps to address the barriers that clearly exist. And you know, they, you heard a lot about them in the first panel, whether it's sexual harassment, discrimination, family leave policies, gender biases that exist, 
we need to work on every front. And that's why I think as an institution, our efforts uh, to address diversity, equity, and inclusion are so important. And I'll talk about those in a, in a moment. Again, the I think an institution has to show time and time again, its commitment to providing a workplace where everyone is welcome, where everyone is respected, where everyone's uh, view is, is, is valued and everyone's role in the institution is valued. And that's something you have to act, act, absolutely commit to uh, and walk the walk in so many different ways to establish credibility that I think ultimately leads people to think that might be an institution I want to be part of. And I think that's something we've really emphasized, particularly in recent years. And as you get more women in leadership roles, I think other women who are looking at the organization say, I could do that. I could, I could, I could take on that role. And often in our history, uh, the women who came early have uh, been generous in their time and support and mentorship. And I absolutely agree with Judge Malway uh, uh, of reaching out to and supporting and encouraging other women uh, to apply to become judges. Uh, judge, uh, my colleagues, Sabrina McKenna uh, and Daryl and Lendia, who tragically passed away recently, great examples of women who actively have encouraged others to uh, think of themselves as judges and to go down the path that it takes to become a judge. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our selection process and then a little bit about our work on, DE, on, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I mentioned uh, we're now at the point of 49% of our full-time judges are women. Uh, that does stand out, as I said, above, uh, above the national average, about 34%. Um, how we got there, I think, is a really complicated question. I'll try to hit a couple of different things that I think are important. I mean, again, I cannot overestimate or overstate the role of the trailblazers like Judge Vitusik, like Judge Justice Nakayama, like Justice McKenna, um, and others uh, who, who have basically blazed the trail and showed how it could be done and inspired others to come into our organization. Marie Milks, the first uh, woman appointed to circuit court back in 1980. And then a number of judges that were appointed by um, John Waihei in the 1990s. I think he appointed 11 women judges, uh, Kareen Watanabe on the ICA, Francis Wong, I believe, well, Francis Wong, uh, became a senior family court judge, Colleen Harai, who became the chief judge of the First Circuit. So Vicki Marks and many others who really set the tone of our organization, I think changed who we were uh, and had this incredible impact out in the community. So I think their role cannot be overstated. Um, I think the fact that we have a merit-based judicial, uh, judicial selection process promotes diversity. Uh, I won't go into all the reasons or, 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 or spend too much time describing that process, but the, we have a JSC, a Judicial Selection Commission, with nine members who recommends uh, candidates to become judges uh, for family court and district court. The recommendations come to me for circuit court and our appellate courts go to the governor. Um, and I think that process, as opposed to an elective uh, system of uh, choosing uh, uh, judges uh, promotes diversity. And I think there, there's work that's been done by the American Judicature Society uh, that's demonstrated that and that merit-based selection leads to a more diverse judiciary. And I think it's just sort of common sense, you know, to run for office and get elected to office, uh, particularly a statewide office, but even on a county basis, you need to have political connections. You need to have money, fr quite frankly, to be able to mount a credible campaign. And instead, uh, I and I interview all of the candidates for family court, district court who are recommended by the commission. And many, many, many of the judges who I appoint are people who had no political experience whatsoever, uh, not necessarily connected to any power base or power system. They're just really good lawyers who care about their community, who decided they wanted to become judges. And so I think the merit-based system gives folks like that the opportunity uh, to be seen and then ultimately to be selected and to become judges. Um, just a few things about how we've approached uh, that system and try to make it work, I think, even better. And there, of course, is work that more work that needs to be done. Uh, one thing is transparency. So we have uh, chosen to collect and publish judicial demographic data. It's on our website. You can see um, how our how our judges identify, uh, how we break down in terms of uh, in terms of both uh, ethnicity and gender, 
Um, we include in our survey uh, a non-binary options uh, so that uh, I think we, 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 we try to be and we try to use that survey as a way uh, to uh, think, think, I guess, smarter and to be more inclusive in the way we approach um, with the way we approach uh, developing and having a more diverse judiciary. Uh, we've engaged a lot, both myself and the Judicial uh, Selection Commission, with specialty bar groups across the state to try to demystify the process, try to encourage uh, folks who might not have thought of themselves as a judge to be able to hear, this is how it works. This is what you need to do. This is the challenges you'll face. And I think that has led to uh, more folks being interested in uh, serving as judges. We've tried to support partners in the community who are doing great work around this issue. Uh, the law school, which is uh, under, under Dean Nelson's leadership, I think doing remarkable things. It's one of the most diverse law schools in the nation. And that's an incredible, uh, incredible, I think, source of talented folks uh, for us as a judiciary as they graduate and then move into careers. And the Hawaii Women Lawyers is actively developing a program uh, to mentor uh, women who are interested in becoming judges. So I think uh, we try to support those partners. We try to get out to as many people as we can to de demystify the process. And I think, you know, ultimately the, the proof is in the pudding, how we approach it, how, who, how we select people, who we select. I think folk, uh, people step back and they look at that and they say, I think that's a fair process. I think I have a shot. I think it's worth it for me uh, to apply and I'm going to go ahead and do it. And I, I, I like to think that's been uh, played a big role in how we've gotten from uh, no women judges in 1970 to 49% of our full-time judges being women now. Um, the other thing I wanted to emphasize and I, is I think the importance of an institutional commitment uh, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that's been something, especially in the last five years or so, we've, we've gone all in on. Um, in 19, uh, 2019, we, developed, we adopted uh, mandatory training every two years for all judges and all employees of our institution. Um, we held a series of uh, seminars on issues around racial equity and systemic injustice in, in the justice system. Uh, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. So we have uh, tried to own up to and engage the systemic issues that exist. Uh, and, and I hope that, that those webinars, we had 500 people who participated. I hope that that sends a message that as an institution, we are deeply committed uh, to living up to our, um, our, our, our sort of guiding principle of justice for all. We have a grassroots uh, DEI working group uh, that is organically sprung up across the state that's uh, sponsored trainings on a number of important topics. Uh, and I'd really like to thank Ian Tapu, uh, my former law clerk, Jennifer Wu, uh, and Lisa Lum for all their efforts in that regard. Um, one other thing I wanted to emphasize, we have a real commitment to Alelo Hawaii. Uh, and I think that's important for reasons I'll, 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 I'll mention in a moment, but we, adopted in 2019 uh, a policy that we will provide interpreters if reasonably feasible uh, to anyone who wants to communicate with the court in the Hawaiian language. Um, we have um, begun to, uh, we've had Hawaiian language training for our employees, about 500 folks have participated in, um, and significantly recently uh, the legislature funded a Hawaiian language coordinator uh, position in Joanna Chok Tam is in that position. And I think we'll be able to do far more uh, to honor and recognize the Hawaii, uh, Olelo Hawaii as a co-official language in the state. Um, in one small way we've done that, although I think a very important one symbolically is that we now call our cases in the Hawaii Supreme Court, uh, both in the Hawaiian land, in Olelo Hawaii and, and in English. So, you know, why does that, why does all that matter? Why does it matter that we're um, focused on Olelo Hawaii? Well, I mean, it's right for it's all, all of the, there's a whole set of reasons as to why it's the right thing to do and, and absolutely the correct thing to do. But I also think, you know, women of color um, face high barriers uh, in particular uh, in becoming judges or in advancing in the legal profession. So we need to identify challenges uh, uh, that, that are specific to them. And that I think by removing those barriers and showing that we're an inclusive place that truly values a uh, Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian language. I think that 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 that's an important step um, in removing barriers and making uh, Native Hawaiian women feel welcome in our organization. 
Um, and so again, I think you have to show a commitment across the organization time and time again. I think folks look at that and they, they begin to understand this is an organization that truly cares, a place where I could see myself being, where my voice will be heard, where I will be seen, where I will be valued. Uh, and that's something we try to do and we've really um, committed to. We have a long way to go, a lot of work to do, uh, but I think um, I think that's played an important role in setting the tone for us as an organization in the last five years or so. So once again, thank you so much for having me and uh, I look forward to uh, being part of the discussion later on. Thank you so much, Chief Justice Rectin Mould, and thank you for your leadership, for being an ally, including to people like Judge Mulway when she was in practice and for uplifting and supporting women and people of color in the state judiciary. Um, now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and have a little short conversation with Judge Ginoza and Judge Castanetti. Um, so Judge, Gino Judge Ginoza first, um, as a model of success for women, both in the practice of law and now as a jurist, your, your success speaks to the evolution in women's access to participation in the courts, especially in the last half century. So I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on what you saw as the greatest barrier to women's participation when you first began your legal career, perhaps what progress has been made in eroding that barrier. And now today, what do you feel represents the greatest barrier moving forward? Well, good morning, Professor Pettit Toledo. Um, I wanna thank uh, Suyon and Sarah uh, for organizing this wonderful event and everyone involved and to my fellow panelists who uh, inspire me greatly. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and as I was thinking about today's uh, discussion, you know, one thing that dawned on me is how important a role, first of all, the William S. Richardson School of Law played in my life and in my legal career. So first of all, I like to just appreciate that so much. Um, and I have a picture on my wall by my door the, the, to my office of my 1989 uh, graduating class from the Willem S. Richardson School of Law. So I see it all the time. And I didn't until yesterday realize what a great symbol of diversity it is. I actually counted. There are 50 of us in that picture and 25 are women. Um, perfectly, uh, you know, the, that 50% that, that Judge Mawley was talking about. And there's other types of great diversity in that picture. And it's reflective of the Richardson Law School, right? Ethnicity, racial background, whether it's many from Hawaii who would have never been able to go to law school, like me probably, uh, and many from our other places in the country. So I wanted to applaud the Richardson School of Law for all that it does. It reflects our community. It, uh, it, it produces, in, you know, lawyers that serve our community. And so that is also very important. And I wanted to make sure to make that point. Um, and it is, it has been crucial to, to my career. So barriers, uh, I graduated in 1989. And uh, I, you know, two things I will mention. So when you are a 2L, you're looking for a clerkship that, you know, for many people, may you know uh, be a pathway to their career so a fellow classmate and I uh, you know we were looking at some of the firms in town uh, she was a a fellow um, study group member with me and we decided to be a package deal two women coming out of law school you know we had done pretty well and looking at the firms at that time it was really important to us to see where women were succeeding and there were big differences um, and, you know, we interviewed at a number of the, the firms around high, town, medium firms, uh, larger firms, but there were clearly some who stood out and that they had women partners who, at that time in the late 80s who were really flourishing in their law firms and also who had uh, younger women associates who were flourishing as well. But we picked one of those firms. Um, it happened to be uh, a, the firm that the Chief Justice Reckonwald uh, was at uh, at that time, uh, Goodsill. Uh, and maybe maybe a little later he came, but anyway, it was, it was we chose Goodsill. And I, I'll just say, you know, Jackie Earl, uh, Lonnie Ewart were two 
women partners at that firm, I don't know if they ever realized what a great inspiration they were to, to me and to other women coming out of law school at that time, to see them succeeding in the way they were. Um, and we also had um, among the active and very, um, I think, uh, uh, mindful associates who represented women, young women lawyers at that time at Goodsill were uh, Justice McKenna, um, Kathy Matayoshi, and Darylin Lendio, who I ended up working with for many, many years. And so I just see how that all just so perfectly laid the groundwork for all of the opportunities that I had. And so it's important to really consciously, actively think about where you not only fit, but where you can flourish and succeed without false barriers, where you will be mentored um, and, and uh, supported in the way that you need to be to succeed. Every lawyer needs that uh, to succeed. The other thing I wanna mention is um, out of law school, I was very, very lucky to receive a clerkship uh, with the US District Court with Judge Samuel P. King. And at that time, I mean, I didn't really realize this until I learned about it when I was looking at the clerkship, but he was the only federal US district court judge at that time that I was aware of who hired um, clerks out of the UH law school. He had his own sort of um, affirmative action, if you will. He would, uh, he, he reserved one of his clerkship, one of his two clerkship positions for a Richardson Law School graduate. And I just happened to be, for whatever reason, that lucky one in that year. Um, and uh, you know, thankfully, that has really changed over the years. I know it has really opened up by the time you know Judge Malway and others came on board. I think the doors really opened up, and there are so many um, Richardson gr uh, graduates who have had that opportunity. And clerkships are a key uh, uh, part of. You know, building that res not only building that resume, but really getting that experience to potentially one day perhaps becoming a judge. It's certainly something that you know law firms will look at for hiring, and it's certainly something that folks will look at should somebody choose to want to apply uh, to be a become a judge later on. So I I really applaud uh, all of the doors that have opened uh, at, at the federal court level. I know Judge Malway has recognized, what a great presentation, Judge Malway, to recognize how far there still is to go. Um, but clerkships certainly are one avenue that really will help in that way. And I rec I saw in the uh, newsletter today, the uh, law school's Kekula Kanavai, that there was a federal clerkship panel that went to the law school in February. Fantastic, that's exactly the kind of opportunities that students need to know about early on. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, in terms of barriers for women judges, I think Chief Justice Rick, uh, Rackerwald talked uh, about the, the selection process, and that's really what it's about in, in my view. People need to understand what that process is. It's a three-step process, right, with the JSC, the appointing authority, and the Senate. And each step of the way, you need folks in there who support women, support, support diversity, support merit, period. Uh, really, you know, all those other things um, are important, Who, what, what your makeup is, but is the person qualified? Can they do the job? And I wanna applaud Chief Justice Rechenwald because he has had such a huge role as the appointing authority for district court judges in the state of Hawaii. Um, and uh, thank you, CJ, for all that you have done um, in terms of uh, leveling the playing field and, and creating opportunities for everybody. Uh, it's so important. So each step of that way, if folks um, really pay attention to what that process is, and not only what the process is, but who are the people who make up that process? That's so key. Uh, and one thing I just want to mention, I know our time is short, is that at the JSC, you know, there was a time back when I was a young lawyer where folks were concerned about whether women were getting a fair shot, whether women were, you know, getting put on lists to be considered by the governor or the CJ at that time. I think that has really gotten a lot better in my sense of, of over time. Um, but it's also important to recognize they, not recognize they don't only put people on the list for vacancies. The JSC 
is is uh, the one body who determines retention. So there were a number of women attorney, uh, women judges who weren't retained at a period of time in the past uh, for which there was great concern. And I just want to mention that currently um, of the nine GSC members, uh, five are, are women. I think that would, there will be two new uh, members coming up. We'll see who gets appointed. But the other thing is in the last 20 years, there have been a number of chairs for the JSC who have been women. Currently, Nadine Ando, Renette Kawakami, who was with the law school, Jackie Young, Susan Ichinose, Sherry Sakamoto, Rosemary Fazio, Amy Adbayani. Really important to see leadership um, uh, across the board uh, at, at such an important commission. So I, would, I, I wanna say that yes, there have been barriers. There continue to be barriers, I think, there has been significant progress, um, but uh, knowing what the process is and knowing who is involved in that process in terms of the judge uh, positions that are out there is, is very important. So thank you. Thank you for those insights, uh, Judge Ginoza. And I know we're running close to time, but we started a few minutes late. So I'm going to take the liberty of uh, going over time into a little bit of the lunch break because I really wanna hear from Judge Castanetti and the final remarks for everyone. So Judge Castanetti, do not feel rushed. I just wanna give that disclaimer now. Um, but, but Judge Castanetti, I would really like to hear your views on how equal gender representation on the bench is essential to promoting effective and impartial administration of justice. And as a judge who you know, is sitting on that trial court bench encountering many different types of people, particularly in foreclosure cases and on the civil calendar, what do you think it means to litigants and women attorneys to see you on the bench presiding over their cases? And do you think your presence as a female jurist has an impact on the cases or litigants one way or the other? I would venture to say, yes, it absolutely does as a former practicing attorney before you doing my first trial. But if so, you know, if you agree, you know, how does that affect um, female attorneys and litigants? Well, thank you so much for having me. And I just will say that it's just a privilege to be on this panel and um, with all of my other co-panelists who I have a lot of admiration and respect for. Um, you know, to answer one of the questions, um, Professor Pettit Toledo, and yes, you did appear in front of me in front of a trot with a bench trial. And I will let everyone know that she did a fantastic job uh, in that trial. Um, but as far as, you know, how the impact that um, a woman judge has when young attorneys or young women attorneys or litigants or parties see that there is a woman judge presiding over a case. And Judge Malway, I, I will say, I think you touched on it. Um, you, you said it's, you know, normal. We want to see, we want people to think this is normal. This is how it should be. And this is how it is. And to give you some context of why I say it that way of how I think it impacts, uh, a woman judge impacts uh, attorneys, women attorneys, as well as parties, is that let me just give context as far as what it was like when I started practicing or was a young lawyer or fresh out of law school. In fact, my first experience with the courts was as uh, an extern, a full-time extern in the US District Court here in Hawaii with Magistrate Judge Barry Curran, who was a wonderful judge and um, unofficial mentor. He probably didn't even realize he was a mentor, but I made him one <laughs> in my mind. But, um, you know, I, there was, it was the fall of 1998 and there was going to be a new judge uh, who was going to be sworn in. And that person was Judge Malway. And so that was my first exposure and Judge Malway, I'm sure you don't know this, but um, I was a small part of your investiture or swearing in ceremony, actually not the ceremony itself. I couldn't sneak into the courtroom to watch it, but I was down at your reception. As an extern, you get asked to help out where you can. And I manned the cookie table to make sure that everybody got their sprinkle cookies as part of your reception. Um, but I was there and that's what I saw. And then as a young deputy prosecutor, 
Um, I saw, I appeared in, as, in courts with as many women judges as there were male judges. And I just wanna mention some of them because I think it's important for everybody to remember um, all of these women judges in state court um, that we all saw and know. And that includes Marsha Waldorf, Colette Garibaldi, Barbara Richardson, uh, Rhonda Nishimura was a district court judge and then a circuit court judge who I appeared in front of. In circuit court, um, of course, there was Lee Crandall, um, Gail Nakatani, Sandra Sims. Um, this was my time when I was starting out. Uh, judge Marks, Vicki Marks, as well as Judge Hefo, and of course, Sabrina McKenna also being in circuit court as well. Those were the women judges that I appeared in front of, and they inspired me every day by being the types of judges that they were. They were competent, they were prepared, they were, them, they were themselves. You know, the earlier panel this morning, I heard Mia Yamamoto say, be yourself, be authentic. And all of these women judges were authentic and genuine on the bench. Each were different, but they were also very inspirational. So what I hope that young women attorneys hear and what they think of is that this is how it should be. This is normal because it feels normal to me. And I have benefited from so many of those women judges uh, who put themselves out there and, and, and put themselves under scrutiny um, in the spotlight to do what they do to enhance the profession. And I hope that's what it means for younger women attorneys that they see that and then emulate it, whether it's as a judge or as a professional, as an attorney to be prepared and be the best that you can be. I think also for litigants, the impact um, that seeing a woman judge preside over their cases has, you know, just from the global perspective, it enhances the legitimacy of the courts. If the public or if participants in court proceedings, if they see, if they, if they view the courts and judges as elitist or as privileged individuals, then that just erodes the trust that um, we need in our, in our justice system. And so to have a diverse bench, wh whether it's men, women, um, people of all races, ethnic backgrounds and so forth, then that's what we want because it does enhance um, the justice system and it lends credibility. And I think Judge Malway, you also mentioned that as well. Um, you know, as for um, representation on the bench and, you know, what the impact it has also uh, for women judges, um, what it has on litigants and, and attorneys and the public, um, I would also add that it just really, it's, I guess I would say from, a, from my perspective as a, as a woman and then a woman judge, my background, my experience is different than my male counterparts. Um, they didn't sit in a deposition where um, they have been called dear or sweetie. Judge Malway, you talked about your experience that you had with Chief Justice Rechtenwald when you were both attorneys. Um, and so they didn't experience that. I've had it, other women judges, women attorneys have all experienced that at some point. And if you didn't, then you should consider yourself very lucky. But my background does lend itself to a different perspective. And I think everybody has heard the quote from Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who we all know was the first woman Supreme Court justice on the United States Supreme Court. And she's often quoted as saying a wise female judge will reach the same conclusion or result as a wise male judge. And in a lot of cases, that's true. If you, you breach a contract case, a commercial case, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that statement. It's, it's, it's very true and accurate. But there could be instances in cases where um, a woman's background uh, and sitting as a judge could lend itself to enhance the discussion of the case and the proceedings that could, in certain limited circumstances, reach a, you know, a more just result, perhaps. I think Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg taught us that um, at, for the work she did as a lawyer, but also on the United States Supreme Court as well, um, that a woman's perspective on the bench can show different um, 
I don't know, just the way laws are interpreted, the impact that it could have on women. I think it just does change the discussion and it makes for a much better justice system overall. Thank you, Judge Castanetti. In our remaining five minutes or so, I wanted to do kind of a, a quick round robin and ask all of you for a brief takeaway addressing what advice would you give young lawyers, women or otherwise, who hope to accomplish the same types of success that all of you have so far in your careers? Or perhaps more specifically, what would you say to young lawyers considering a career on the bench, perhaps in the future? And I'd like to start with Judge Malway and then TJ Rechtenwald and then Judge Ginoza and then Judge Castanetti. Um, I, I think it's really important to maintain a sense of humor. Um, when I became a judge, I was so worried that em when emotional things occurred that I would get caught up in that emotion. That actually didn't happen. People cry in court and so forth. But the as a judge, I was so in my role of trying to process information that I needed to make a decision that I, I didn't feel myself slipping into an emotional reaction. But what I could not help was that um, unexpectedly hilarious things would happen. And it was really hard for me not to burst out laughing, which of course would have been quite insulting to the people who were saying these hilarious things very seriously. And, and yet, you know, I'd come back into chambers and I tell my law clerks, I think um, it, it's a fantastic uh, survival mechanism to be able sometimes not to take you ser yourself seriously and to um, enjoy these funny moments. Um, and and I, I think it has a healing kind of effect. So I would urge people um, as serious as the work that lawyers and judges do, enjoy the humor that comes along with it. Thank you, Judge Molly. And I remember having some good laughs with you in yes. chambers. So thank you for teaching me that lesson early on. Uh, CJ Rechtenwald? You know, I guess uh, I'll just share from the perspective of someone who's, you know, I guess selected something like 50 or 60 uh, district or family court judges. I mean, you know, I, I look for excellence. I look for sort of a, um, you know, a, a, a real devotion to developing the skills of whatever type of practice somebody has chosen. And that that trial skills are obviously very important. Uh, but I think also, you know, it's you, the way the practice of law has evolved, particularly in the civil arena, not that many people go, get to go to trial anymore. And so I think uh, for me, I've always looked at and considered the fact that someone has done a lot of mediation or someone's done administrative agency proceedings uh, or arbitration or other alternatives to con conventional trials, I think is equally valid and, 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 and prepares them well for the challenges they might face in a courtroom. And I think, you know, taking on diverse challenges, changing course, maybe at some point in your career, trying something very different, I think is a positive. Um, and being active in the community and, and, and sort of understanding your obligation uh, to perform pro bono service and to um, and to give back to folks who can't afford a lawyer, um, I think is really important to me. And I look for that because I'm looking for someone who's going to take advantage, take this opportunity and become an incredible leader and someone who's going to uh, be a wonderful, you know, wonderful judge in the courtroom, but also uh, someone who uh, will be a leader and shape our organization for decades to come. So those are some of the things I look for. It's not it's not easy to do all those things. And it's, you know, important that throughout, um, you know, there, there, there are times when you need to pay attention to your, your responsibilities with your family. There are times when you might not be able to do pro bono service. And I, I absolutely, I understand that. So I think finding that balance between your professional excellence and your ability to be the kind of person you want to be uh, for the people uh, you love and care about is is really essential too. So I guess those would be 
things that I always think about as I talk to people and get to know people and sort of try to decide, is this someone who will uh, do wonderful things with the opportunity that goes along with becoming a judge? Thanks, BJ. Those are great tips. Um, judge Ginoza? Well, I don't think you can get uh, any better advice than to hear from an appointing authority like CJ. Um, but, you know, some of the things I, I want to um, mention is, you know, whatever role you find yourself in, do good work. I mean, you know, just uh, commit yourself to, to doing that, uh, the, the work that's before you. And you will be surprised how many people notice. I mean, I, I'm one of those Judge Maui. I never, ever thought of applying to be a judge until somebody tapped me on the shoulder, you know, uh, when vacancies occurred um, not long before I actually applied for a job. And so what I realized is that there, you know, folks notice and I didn't know, um, but just try to do good work wherever you are as a, as, as your role in, as being a, an attorney, you know, as an officer for the court in the first place. Um, surround yourself with great mentors. That's a, that's an easy one if, as much as you possibly can. And I really wanted to stress what CJ um, just mentioned, which is family, because the practice of law, the legal profession is challenging, uh, you know, day in and day out. And um, it, it's a marathon and a sprint sometimes. You need your family um, support around you. So pay attention to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Ginoza. And Judge Castanetti, you get the final word. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I agree with what everyone has said. Have a sense of humor. Don't take yourself too seriously. I think what Chief Justice Rechtenwald has said as far as the traits and qualities that he looks for in candidates, I think is so important to know and know the process. And then also um, Judge Ginoza, what she has said as well. Um, but you know, to wrap things up, I would say one: be yourself and be authentic, right? Don't you can you can look at the qualities of somebody and how they work and how they are in court, but don't try and imitate them. You have to be yourself. Um, be brave in your careers. If you're just starting out your legal career, be brave. Have confidence. Um, I, when I was, you know, first out of law school and, and a deputy prosecutor going into court, I would prepare, over-prepare, worry about what the judge was going to ask me, what if I don't know, but that set the foundation and I built upon that and that work ethic, but put yourself out there, don't be afraid to put yourself out there, don't get in your head, get out of your head, don't talk yourself out of something Put yourself out there and do it and the rewards will come be a professional be prepared work hard um it takes every, there's a lot of people and they make it look easy but it does take a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice but it is well well worth it and yes people will notice and you will get encouraged and put into other positions um, where you can then influence others as you go on about your career. So thank you all very much. Mahalo everyone. Before you sign off, uh, we want to take a, the law review is going to take a couple of photos online. So I'm also going to just count to three and just smile and someone will take it hopefully. So ready, one, two, three. Okay, hopefully they got some good ones. Um, I just want to express my warm mahalo to everyone and thank you all for allowing me to moderate this panel into your lunch break. Um, this has been a fantastic morning so far, and I'm just gonna quickly turn it over to Suyan and, and Sarah in case there's any announcements, but thank you so much. Thank you all of, to all the panelists. I, I'm greatly honored and indebted to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Malway, Chief Justice Rechtenwall, Chief Judge Ganoza, Judge Castanetti, and Professor Pettit Toledo. We're so grateful and honored to be in company with and led by such esteemed and successful members of the legal community. Thank you all for sharing your experiences and your stories and for your dedication to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the judiciary. That was a fantastic first half of the symposium. Thank you all very much to all of our impressive panelists and moderators thus far. We will now take our lunch break and resume at 1 p.m. 
We welcome you to stay logged on if you'd like and enjoy our playlist featuring Hawaiian and local music by women artists. Special shout out to our executive editor, Hi'ile Kasko, for creating the playlist. Thank you. We'll see you soon. <laughs>